Good morning, everybody. Uh, today's topic is going to be conduits, and I'll mainly focus on the right ventricle to pulmonary artery conduits, which is the commonest use for conduits in pediatric cardiac surgery. Occasionally, conduits are used in other portions, maybe the aortic root sometimes, sometimes in aorta reconstruction, but uh, the vast majority of times that conduits are used and are of relevance to our speciality is the right ventricle to pulmonary artery conduit. So the right ventricle to pulmonary artery conduit is usually required whenever there is a lack of continuity between the right ventricle and the pulmonary artery, or there is a difficult routing. So in most situations where this sort of a connection is required, then it is established outside of the heart, so it's called an extra cardiac. And so you need a tubular structure, and preferably one which has a valve incorporated, which mimics the native pulmonary valve. So these type of tubes are referred to as valved conduits. Whenever we talk about right ventricle to pulmonary artery conduit, we have to remember this very bright young surgeon, Giancarlo Rastelli. Uh, he was born in Italy in 1933, a very bright surgeon, moved on on a scholarship to the United States and worked at the Mayo Clinic, and unfortunately died of Hodgkin's lymphoma in 1970 at the age of 36 years. During this period, his contributions to cardiac surgery have been phenomenal, and you would all be familiar with the Rastelli classification for common atrioventricular septal defects. But his other major contribution was the description of the Rastelli operation for transfusion VST pulmonary stenosis. And he popularized the use of the conduit as an extra cardiac conduit to establish the connection between the right ventricle and pulmonary artery in situations where a natural connection did not exist. So today the common indications for the use of conduits in patients with pulmonary atresia generally those with a ventricular septal defect or a tetralogy of fallow physiology. Patients in tetralogy of fallow with absent pulmonary valve, where you would like to have a competent valve, the transposition, ventricular septal defect, and either pulmonary stenosis or pulmonary artery, this is which the rastelic procedure was originally described. And here, although there is a connection that exists between the ventricles and the pulmonary artery, but this connection cannot be maintained at the end of a complete repair because the left ventricle has to get rooted to the aorta and because of the position of the pulmonary artery which lies in the posterior position, a direct connection cannot be established. A double outlet right left ventricle has a similar situation. Truncus arteriosus is one where truly there is no connection between the right ventricle and the pulmonary artery. There is a common arterial trunk and which common arterial trunk is utilized for the left ventricle to the arterial systemic circulation, and therefore a fresh connection has to be established between the right ventricle and the pulmonary artery. And in patients with corrected transposition with either pulmonary atresia or pulmonary stenosis, then an extra cardiac conduit becomes part of what we call as a senning rastelli procedure, where you correct the atrioventricular discordance by means of the sending procedure, and you correct the ventricular arterial discordance by means of an intracardiac routing of the left ventricle to the aorta, and an extracardiac connection between the right ventricle and the pulmonary artery. So what are the common conduits in use? I have listed some of them. There are many other commercial conduits which are available in different countries and different parts of the world. Uh, I'm not going to list all of them, but basically give you examples of some of them to describe what material is being used and whether they are commercial or they are homemade. So one of the earliest conduits to be used were the homograft conduits. The homograft basically mean, mean that this is tissue harvested from a dead human being, and homografts could either be aortic or pulmonary. That means it could be the aortic valve and the ascending aorta or the pulmonary valve and the pulmonary artery with its branches. 
The second common is the Dacron with porcine valve. It's the outer tube was made of Dacron. And within it was placed a porcine valve, the porcine aortic or a porcine pulmonary valve, and they went by the commercial companies which distributed them, the Hancock as well as the Edwards. The other conduit is bovine pericardium with the porcine valve. This is marketed by St. Jude, where the tubing was made out of bovine pericardium, and within it was housed a porcine valve with an stent. Currently, one of the commoner conduits that's used is the Contegra conduit. The Contegra conduit is essentially the jugular vein harvested from cow, and this is fairly sizable because the cow is large and it comes in varying sizes, starting from roughly 12 millimeters in diameter, going up to 22 millimeters in diameter. And the jugular venous valve, which exists naturally, then serves the function of the pulmonary valve. And then, of course, there are many, many conduits which can be made in the operating room itself. Many surgeons prefer to do this, both for reasons of economy and for reasons of availability. So you get sheets of bovine pericardium, you can make a tube out of it, and then you can create a valvular structure inside with either autologous pericardium or with thin PTFE, which is also known as PTFE membrane. You could do the same thing using Dacron tube or a PTFE tube and put a pericardial or a PTFE valve inside. So there are very many permutations and combinations that can be used. Essentially, what you need is a tube, and you need a functioning valve within that tube, and that constitutes a conduit. So a few pictures to show what these various conduits look like. Uh, the remaining talk will have a little more of a surgical tilt, and I think Although most of you are training to be cardiologists, it's essential for you to know some of these surgical aspects so that then you understand why patients with conduits get into problems or what are the areas that you need to look for when you follow up these patients and appropriately advise these patients according to the long-term outcomes and prognosis. So on the left, you see aortic homograft. On the right is a pulmonary homograft. And you can see the very obvious differences in the two. You can see that the aortic homograft is much more thick old. There's much thicker muscle at the lower end of the homograft because this comes out of the left ventricle outflow, which is much thicker. And you can also see that there are the two coronary arteries which come out of the base of the aortic homograft, and these have to be closed and like. On the right is the pulmonary homograph. You can see that the pulmonary homograph is thinner. And you can also see that while the aortic homograph retains its circular shape because it has a lot of elastic uh, layer, and so even in the harvested homograph, it retains its circular shape, whereas the pulmonary homograph has very little elastic lamina. It's thin and more pliable, and it just collapses, as you can see on the right. And also, it has a lot less muscle at the base. It's for these reasons that the pulmonary homograft is better suited as a right ventricle to pulmonary artery conduit because A, nature made that pulmonary, uh, uh, pulmonary valve and the pulmonary artery in order to be a volume receptacle. And I'll subsequently come to the differences and the problems with these homograms. The homographs now can be either fresh and antibiotic sterilized. Apologies for that spelling mistake there. Uh, these are by and large no longer used. In the early days, before techniques of cryopreservation were available, this was, uh, so the fresh homograph was harvested from usually the autopsy room and then immediately cleaned and soaked in antibiotic solution. And then it could be used after two, three days while being kept in a refrigerator. The problem with this is that A, the homographs could not be stored for long, and therefore you could use it only when it was available. The second is the cryopreserve. So subsequently, technology of cryopreservation was evolved. Basically, 
is progressive freezing of the homograft in liquid nitrogen so that it could be preserved indefinitely. So as you are aware that biological tissues can be preserved for many, many years even in liquid nitrogen. So once the homograft is harvested and it is sterilized using antibiotic sterilization, then it's cryopreserved after sizing and adequate labeling so that then it is available for use as and when required. So many institutions have developed a homograph bank as long as they have availability of these um, cadaveric hearts to harvest the homographs. And then they can have various sizes of the homographs available to them from the homograph bank. Therefore, you are not specifically dependent upon scheduling your surgery depending upon the availability of a homograph. In the United States and some European countries, homographs are now available commercially. There's a company called Cryolife, which supplies homographs commercially. And these companies generally get the hearts which are taken out during either a transplant or from other sources. And then they are commercially available so that you can purchase them just like you purchase other conduits. The, unfortunately, this commercial cryo life is not available in our country. So what are the advantages of homographs? They are economical. If you have your own homograph bank and you have a steady supply of cadaveric hearts from the forensic laboratory or from the autopsy rooms or the mortuary, then it becomes economical because the cost of preparing a homograft and storing it in liquid nitrogen is much less than the cost of purchasing a commercially available conduit. Because they're biological tissues, they're easier to implant as compared to the dacron grafts, uh, which require a more stiffer and the suture lines tend to bleed more. The only disadvantages, as you can see, but there is not much tissue below the level of the valve. There's no tube below the level of the valve. So when you put a homograft, you can suture the distal end to the pulmonary artery, but proximally to the right ventricle, then you need an extension of either pericardium or dacron or some other material in order to complete the conduit. So it's an incomplete conduit in that sense. What are the other types of conduits? The commercially available conduits fall into several categories. As I said, the commonest currently used commercial conduit is the Contegra conduit. And it has two varieties. One that you can see on the left, the one which has rings at the level of the valve. This is called the stented Contegra conduit. And these rings are basically put to prevent the valve from collapsing or from external compression. The disadvantages, of course, is that it restricts the mobility of the valve to some extent. You can get the non-stented variety, which you see above. And here, there is no ring which is confining the valve. So the advantage is that it allows the valve to expand and uh, shrink in size, depending upon systole or diastole. But the disadvantage is that if there is a compression between the sternum and the heart, then this valve will become incompetent. And so there are, depending upon the sort of site that you're using it, you may choose one of the two. On the right hand side, you see the other commonly commercially available conduit, which is the Dacron conduit with a valve inside. And you can see the valve inside can either be a pericardial valve or it can be a porcine aortic or pulmonary valve. So different companies sell different modifications of these. The outer tube is Dacron. And you can see what is known as the crimping of the Dacron, that this, like Dacron tubes, uh, it has uh, multiple folds on its outer wall. Now these fine folds allow the tube to be bent without it kinking. So as you bend the tube, it retains its circular shape all through, and that's why it's known as a crimped graft. Now, these are examples of handmade conduits. So you can do this in the operating room, and many surgeons, for economic reasons and other situations where a commercially available conduit is not uh, 
uh, readily available. Then this is the way you make a conduit. You take a sheet of bovine pericardium, and then you can suture three cusps there. You can have three cusps. You can make it two cusps. Whether you want a bicuspid valve or a tricuspid valve, there are various measurements available for sizing these cusps, and then you suture it in this fashion. And once you fold this, it becomes a conduit. So there's a valve inside and a tube outside. One of the most reliable of these conduits is the Japanese conduit. Now, this was described by a surgeon known as Yamagichi in Japan. They have undergone several modifications of this conduit, but the most currently most popular one is the PTFE. The whole conduit is made of uh, polytetrafluoroethylene, also goes by the commercial name of Gore-Tex. So the outer tube is a tube of Gore-Tex, and inside are sutured three leaflets in the shape of a fan. The initial ones they made were straight tubes of Gore-Tex, but then they realized that the longevity could be improved if you created sinuses in the Gore-Tex tube, mimicking the normal aortic or the pulmonary valve sinuses. So this is known as a handmade PTFE conduit with bulging sinuses with fan-shaped PTFE membrane valve. Now, the Japanese use this almost exclusively, and they've shown excellent longevity and long-term survival with the use of this. Unfortunately, they are neither commercially made, nor is this technology available outside of Japan, and therefore, the experience with this remains strictly limited to Japan. So, how do you go about choosing what type of conduit that you would like to use for a particular patient? The most important factor, of course, is the availability. You can only use those conduits which are actually available to you. Then, especially in our country, is the issue of cost. So no matter what we do, cost always becomes an important factor in looking at anything that we do and any implant that we use. Then it also depends upon whether it's a primary implant or a redo. If a patient is having a replacement of a previously placed conduit, then it is generally thought that if the earlier implant has been a homograft, it's probably not wise to replace it with a homograft because the patient may have developed some antibodies to the antigens present in the prior homograft, and there may be chances that the second homograft, if placed, would degenerate more rapidly. So if the first replacement has been a homograft, it's preferable then to do the next replacement with a Dacron conduit or a Contegra conduit. It also depends upon the distance between your proposed right ventriculotomy and the pulmonary artery. If it's a long distance, then it may be disadvantageous to use a homograft because they said that the homograft requires a proximal extension and then, if you have to use uh, another tube to bridge that gap between the right ventriculotomy and the homograft, then you lose many of the advantages of the homograft. The proposed lie of the conduit is also important. And if you expect that the conduit is going to lie in position, I'll show you some diagrams later on, where there is likely to be compression between the heart and the sternum or the rib cage, then you'd prefer to use a valve which is stented, like I showed you the rings around the valve, then that conduit is then likely to perform better even if there is a mild degree of compression. And then it's also important whether the patient is likely to have right ventricular hypertension at the end of the surgery. If, for example, your distal pulmonary artery bed is not adequate, if there is borderline hypoplasia of the pulmonary arteries, then you expect that there is going to be some degree of right ventricle to pulmonary artery gradient. And when there is right ventricular hypertension, then the conduit will be subjected to a higher pressure. And if you use a conduit like, for example, the Contegra conduit, which doesn't have a rigid support, then it's likely to distend or become aneurysmal. So if you have a situation where the patient either has pulmonary vascular disease or borderline pulmonary arteries and you expect that the RV pressure is going to be elevated post-surgery, 
it's preferable to use a Dacron conduit rather than use a conduit like the Contegra conduit. A few surgical considerations which are important. And conduit replacement is all about very fine surgical considerations which are going to improve the life of your conduit and reduces the chances of your post-operative complications. So it's important to choose the right size. I'll come to why this is important subsequently. The lie of the conduit is important. That means when you position the conduit from the right ventricle to the pulmonary artery, whether it's going to go to the left of the aorta or the right of the aorta, the sighting of the pulmonary artery incision is important. The positioning of the conduit valve, whether it's going to be closer to the pulmonary artery or closer to the right ventricular incision, where you place the right ventriculotomy, the angulation of the right ventriculotomy, and then how you curve the conduit. So I'll go through each of these points one by one and the importance in the performance of the conduit. Ultimately, when you place a conduit, your aim is to achieve the shortest path from the right ventricle to pulmonary artery, providing a non-obstructed, non-turbulent flow into the both pulmonary arteries equally it's not that one artery should receive more flow as compared to the others. With a competent pulmonary valve and with no compression of the coronary arteries, and it should be free from retrosternal compression. So these are all of the factors which one has to pay importance to while placing a conduit in the operating room. And secondly, we know that no conduit grows with age, but at least the conduit should allow for a reasonable period of patient growth that means your subsequent change of the conduit, which is inevitable, should at least be much longer than, uh, as long as possible. So when it comes to size, the most important thing is that one should not oversize. There is a tendency for some surgeons to try and put as large a size as possible, thinking that if you put a large size, the chances of replacement, the time for replacement would be pushed further. But that's not entirely true. The ideal size is roughly about two sizes above the required pulmonary artery size for that patient. For example, if you're taking a child who is 12 kilograms, the no gamogram says that for 12 kilograms, the required pulmonary artery annulus diameter is 12 millimeters. So in this patient, the ideal size would be 16, which is two sizes above. 14 is the next size, 16 is the next size. So, so if you put a 16 millimeter conduit, that is appropriate. Why is it important? Because when you oversize, then there is a distortion of the bifurcation because the pulmonary arteries are not going to be that big. Your conduit is very broad, and when you try and suture the distal end into smaller pulmonary arteries, it will tend to pull up the pulmonary artery distally and produce bifurcation stenosis. There's also chances that when you have a large conduit in a small chest size, there will be compression behind the sternum, and when the valve annulus gets compressed, it produces valve insufficiency, and this incompetent valve is going to degenerate much faster. Thirdly also, to accommodate a larger size conduit, you need to make a much larger ventricle artery. And when you do that, then there is more potential for right ventricular dysfunction. And this is going to be compounded in a situation where the, um, the patient already has some amount of uh, right ventricular compromise in the volume because of the placement of uh, intracardiac tube. So when you're doing uh, left ventricle to aorta, connection, there's a fairly large left ventricular patch which goes inside. So that compromises the right ventricular volume. And then placement of a large ventriculotomy further then compromises the right ventricle. So this is what I meant by placing a large conduit in a small pulmonary artery. So when you do that, you can see that this is a big conduit. The pulmonary artery is relatively small. And when you suture that, very soon you'll find that the flower leaf type of bifurcation stenosis can be produced.
So the lie of the conduit is governed by A, the situs of the heart, the position of the ascending aorta, whether it's D or L post, the ventricular arterial relationship, the site of the right ventriculotomy, the available retrosternal space, and the position of the major coronary arteries. So when there is a situs inversus, the conduit has to be in a different position. When the ascending aorta is D or L post, you need to decide again whether the conduit comes to the left or the right. When the ventricular artery relationship is discordant, then the position of the heart may be. So this is the ideal lie of the conduit, which is in the natural position, as the natural pulmonary artery would lie. So you would like the conduit to take off from the distalmost part of the right ventricle towards the infundibulum. And then the distal part of the conduit should be at the PA bifurcation, distributing blood uniformly to both the right and the left pulmonary artery. And the conduit should lie in its natural position to the left of the aorta. Now, this is possible if the aorta is in normal position or the D-loop aorta. Okay, if the atrioventricular connection is concordant, and the heart is lying in the normal levo position. But this is not always the case. When there's a situs inverse situation or in a corrected transposition with L post aorta, if you try to put the conduit from front of the aorta, then it's going to lie in the midline and it's likely to get compressed between the aorta and the sternum. So it's preferable to put the conduit on the left of the aorta. In this way, it goes further into the pleural cavity, but this avoids compression. You try to put the conduit like this in front of the aorta, then this is where it's likely to produce compression. It's also likely to compress on the coronary arteries, which often take off from the front of the aorta. Very often, because of the fact that the anastomosis to the main pulmonary artery might end up in a situation where the conduit is coming in front of the heart. Here is a situation where there is ventricular arterial discordance. The pulmonary artery is lying posteriorly and the main pulmonary artery is lying to the right of the aorta. Now, if you try to put a conduit here in this fashion, it's going to compress the right coronary artery. So in this situation, you close off the main pulmonary artery stump, open up the left pulmonary artery and put a conduit to the left of the ascending aorta, thereby avoiding the coronary artery compression. So you maintain normal NPA and bifurcation anastomosis when you do the distal anastomosis. You try to extend the branch pulmonary artery, and you try to move the conduit away from the aorta so that the distal end doesn't have to twist behind the aorta. You address pulmonary artery stenosis if present with a separate pericardial patch and don't try to use the conduit itself to address the pulmonary artery stenosis. The distal conduit should be beveled appropriately. And when you're using a thicker conduit like a contegra or a aortic homograft, then you limit the anastomosis to an intima to intima anastomosis rather than taking a full thickness of the conduit. It's important to realize that why the distal end has to be bewilled. That when you look at the lie of the pulmonary artery bifurcation in the normal heart, the bifurcation and the orientation of the left pulmonary artery where the conduit normally goes is at an angle. So this is the anteroposterior axis. And if you take the axis of the left pulmonary artery, it bends posteriorly at an angle. So that's why it's important that the distal end of the conduit has to be beveled. If you use a straight cut in the distal end, then you're likely to twist the left pulmonary artery when the conduit fills up and the heart starts ejecting into it. The second aspect, as I said, that most of these conduits are thick-walled. The pulmonary artery is a thin-walled structure. So when you do the anastomosis, you should just take the intima and check it to the pulmonary artery. When you take a thick wall, you're more likely to produce a distal pulmonary artery stenosis. 
So that's how the distal anosmosis should look like. It should lie in such a way that the blood flow to both the right as well as the left is uniform. So the flow to the right pulmonary artery should occur in a uniform way. Likewise, the flow to the left pulmonary artery. So the conduit should hemodynamically function in such a way that there is no preferential flow to either pulmonary artery. The second important aspect is how to curve the conduit. This is important because when you're using a Dacron conduit, then as I showed you, the curvature occurs quite effortlessly because of the nature of the conduit. But when we're using other materials like Vortex or the Contegra, then they don't have a crimping. And if you try to bend it excessively, then there's likely to be kinking. So the curving is important because the level of the right ventricle and the level of the pulmonary artery are at two different levels. In the pulmonary artery bifurcation lies much more posteriorly in the human anatomy as compared to the anterior wall of the right ventricle. So the conduit has to take a curve. And you can see that these both are in parallel planes. So the right ventricular takeoff is horizontal. And the conduit has to then, blood flow has to come and take a curve and go to the pulmonary artery. So the maintaining this curvature for the conduit is a very important aspect. So the right ventriculotomy is also equally important because that's also going to cover govern the hemodynamics of the conduit. The right ventriculotomy has to be aligned with the lie of the conduit. It should allow reasonable conduit length for a comfortable valve position. It should be away from major coronary artery branches. And very often that happens that there are large coronal branches uh, which supply the anterior wall of the right ventricle, which can get injured and can cause ventricular dysfunction if the ventriculotomy is not sighted appropriately. It should also be away from the papillary muscle attachments so that you don't cause valvular dysfunction. It's important not just to make an incision, but to take out a small ellipse of muscle so that the edges don't fall back together. And often this becomes a cause for stenosis of the proximal conduit to right ventricular anastomosis. And it's also important to bevel the edges of the incision so that the right ventricle, especially in a hypertrophied right ventricle, it can be very thick walled. And if you do an anastomosis to a thick wall right ventricle without thinning out the edges, then that predisposes to conduit stenosis. So the direction of the right ventriculotomy is important. One, it's important to avoid uh, going too close to the coronary arteries. So it's important often to stay parallel to the coronary artery. If you make an incision like this, you're likely the incision, if it accidentally extends, it will injure the coronary. Second, it should remain in the same direction as the lie of the conduit. So if my conduit is going to be positioned in this direction, the ventriculotomy should be in the same direction. If you have a ventriculotomy in the opposite direction, then again, it is not hemodynamically suitable and it's likely to cause flow-related problems. So this is what I mentioned, that this is going to be my lie of the conduit, so my ventriculotomy is going to be in this direction. So, and then what do I mean by bevelling? If you don't bevel and if you leave the ventriculotomy so thick walled, you can see that there is likely to be tissue overgrowth here and more turbulence, whereas if you bevel the ventriculotomy at the site of the anastomosis, then you can get a more uniform flow into the conduit. So these are finer technical points which are important while placement of a conduit. So how do we position the conduit? And this is just a schematic diagrams to show. If you take a cross section in the pulmonary artery cross section at the bifurcation, as you can see, it's lying at a lower level than the ventriculotomy. And you can also see that the planes of these are very different. The plane of the pulmonary arteriotomy is in this direction. The plane of the ventriculotomy is in this direction. So once you do the distal anastomosis, it's important that you place the valve in this sort of cavity, which is available just distal to the right ventricle and between the pulmonary artery and the right ventricle. The sternum would be coming somewhere here. So you avoid placing the valve directly in that area between the ventricle and the sternum. 
and then you go ahead to place the proximal anastomosis and this is the second more important aspect of it that the proximal anastomosis has to be done in such a fashion that the proximal end of the conduit forms a hood it should not be a flat line like this if you do that then again there will be conduit stenosis proximally so when you use a homograft as i mentioned with the homograft it just ends with a small ring of muscle immediately below the valve there is no further extension below it so when you use a homograft you can suture a posterior portion of the homograft to the right ventriculotomy but then the anterior portion has to be completed with a patch of pericardium or a patch of dacron so the conduit when it's homograft at the pulmonary or aortic always needs an extension proximally now this is not required when you use a contegra because the contegra or a dacron tube has a sizable length of tube even proximal to the valve so that's the site of the valve that's the distal anastomosis and the proximal long tube can then be fashioned cut and used to create the proximal hood and this is what we mean by hood this is a diagram from the Japanese Gotex tube. So once you've done the distal anastomosis, you start the proximal suturing, and then you fashion the proximal tube in such a way that you get sufficient length to create a hood like this. So it has to be a uniform connection between the right ventricle and the pulmonary artery, giving adequate space, and this should be a nice bulge and not flattened out. And so that's how it should look on the operating table. As you can see. This is a bovine pericardial conduit with a valve inside. You can see how nicely the proximal end forms a bulbous portion. So this prevents stenosis of the proximal anastomosis. So last, we come to what happens to conduits. Now it's important to realize that conduits do not mimic nature, and all conduits have a finite lifespan. They eventually go into degenerate they go into narrow and they go into need replacement and that is the most unfortunate and it remains the achilles heel in pediatric cardiac surgery because this is one area which we have not found a solution for so far so most conduits develop luminal narrowing the wall as well as the valve tend to get calcified because of a degenerative process when you use a contegra there is also a potential possibility of aneurysmal dilatation especially if there is right ventricular hypertension post operatively the longevity is directly proportional to the size see the smaller the size of the conduit the more likely it is to degenerate earlier or more likely that the patient will outgrow the conduit so by and large the two aspects which govern the longevity one is of course the nature of the conduit and second is the quality of the surgical procedure so if you don't adhere to all the finer points which i have mentioned so far then you are likely that for the same conduit the longevity will be lesser if it has been badly placed as compared to a conduit which has been placed with appropriate precautions in mind so what happens with stenosis this is a ct showing a uh, conduit over a course of time as you can see the conduit has narrowed the pulmonary arteries are of good size but this is the conduit valve and there is a uniform tubular narrowing now this narrowing can occur because of tissue ingrowth you can see that this is an explanted conduit the valves are reasonably okay but you can see that the wall has become excessively thickened because of what we call as intimal hyperplasia or intimal deposition or a fibrous peel formation but more importantly the problem with the homographs is that they tend to calcify and with time the calcification can become so dense that it becomes almost like bone so you can see the ct scan that is the homograft is placed and the homograft is completely densely calcified into a tube and even the valve inside has become rock like with valve and it is so difficult to fix out you can see this the homograft conduit we trying to remove it is impossible to even to cut into it we have had to use a saw to cut into the conduit and use a bone nibbler to excise the piece so that is how bad these conduits can become with course of time so this is important for you and you as cardiologists to realize that 
Replacing a conduit is quite a surgical challenge. It is not as straightforward as it might seem to be. Problem of calcification exists not only with tissues, but also with inert substance like PTFE. This is an explanted PTFE graph. You can see the leaflets which are made of PTFE have dense deposits of calcium, which have made the conduit very dysfunctional. You will find lots and lots of articles on long-term fate of conduits. I'll just show you a few slides just to illustrate the concept that none of the conduits have a very long longevity. This is the paper from the Japanese group, Shinkawa et al., in 2015, comparing their own Gore-Tex conduit with conduits made from other materials, the Hancock conduit, the non ptf PTFE conduit, and the Permian homograft. And you can see when they are smaller sized, almost all the conduits have a very limited lifespan. By the age of 10 to 15 years after implantation, almost 80% of these conduits need to be replaced. Whereas in the older population, their longevity is better. They last 15 to 20 years. And more important that the palmy homograph tends to do much better than the other types of homographs in the older especially. So if you want, have, doesn't have recourse to any uh, uh, the, the Gore-Tex valve, then probably the palmy homograft is the best choice as far as conduits are concerned. Again, comparing pulmonary and aortic homographs, the palmy homographs do far better than the aortic homographs in terms of longevity. When you look at longevity versus the age of the patient, as I said, the smaller the age, obviously the conduit that's going to be used is going to be smaller. So age less than one year, the longevity is much less than in patients who are older than one year. When this group, Tweddle et al., looked at the various factors which contributed to homograft failure, then they found that those which were significant were the younger age of the patient, the longer warm ischemic time, that means the quality of the homograft, the time that it was the patient died and the time it was harvested. If that was longer, then the homograft tend to degenerate earlier. Again, size mattered. Aortic homograft performed worse than pulmonary homografts. And then, of course, Previous procedure, if there was, if the patient had a previous conduit, then there's a likelihood of degenerating earlier. So to summarize, right ventricle to pulmonary artery conduits are an essential component of congenital heart surgery, but have finite longevity. Proper placement of the conduit is very important. It is important to Take care of the finer points that I have mentioned. Careful study of preoperative imaging studies and intraoperative anatomy is crucial to planning the conduit placement. And a thorough knowledge of the handling characteristic of each conduit is essential for making a patient-specific choice of the conduit. Thank you very much. I look forward to questions.